Well, good morning. We are so glad that you have decided to join us here at New City Church for our online service this morning. My name is Christina, and this is my good friend, Emily. I'm Emily. Hi. So yeah, if you guys want to go ahead and share this video um, so that we can get as many people to view this as we can, um, and comment to the side or below if you're on mobile, um, we'd love to interact with you as we go through the service. Um, but speaking of, Christina, uh, what is the restaurant you miss the most right now? I miss Chick-fil-A so much and being able to go inside. As a mom, yeah. they just treat you like a goddess, and it's just so <laughs> heavenly and I miss it so much. What about you? Uh, I'd say Sushi Siam. Uh, we know like the waitress is there and they sit with us while we eat sometimes. And so it's like when we take it to go, we're like, bye. Yeah, I it's, miss you. it's not the same. It's so we would same. love to hear from you guys. What is the restaurant that you miss the most going to down below? We would love to engage with you just so that you kind of know what's going to happen this morning, the flow of service. We're going to start with some worship this morning, just worshiping our God through song. And then we're going to, we have a special Mother's Day plan for video plan for you. And then after that, we're going to hear a message from Colossians. Yeah, so right now we're going to start worship. If you want to stand up and party hardy, that's your choice. If you want to sit on the couch and just take it in, let's go for it. Good morning, New City. I uh, hope everyone's doing wonderful. Uh, please join me in worship as we worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.
Um, I just appreciate how she has always supported me in everything that I've done, whether that been school or church or ministry um, or just anything in life. She's always been one of my biggest supporters. I'm grateful to my mom for always encouraging me to be creative and pushing me to work harder. And one thing I really appreciate about my mom is the way she intentionally cares for people uh, by reaching out, especially in times like these, just reaching out, you know, texting me, calling me and letting me know that she cares. I'm grateful for my mom's servant heart. Uh, she always goes out of her way to put other people above yourself and that's something that is really inspirational to me. My mom is without exaggeration literally the kindest person on the planet and has always been a huge supporter of, uh, of us especially when it came to going into ministry. Mom you're the best. I love you. Happy Mother's Day. No matter my interest or goal my mom has always stood behind me 100% and supported me however she could and it's because of her selflessness that I've been able to achieve not only what I've done, but more than I could have ever done on my own. And I'm incredibly grateful for that. I'm thankful for my mom for taking care of me and my sisters. Um, one thing that I'm extremely grateful for from my mother is her hospitality. She's an extremely loving person, always willing to have people over to our house. Um, she hosts the college students regularly which is something she's been missing since this quarantine. One of the things I'm really grateful for my mom for is her faith and specifically how she, how she prays. Uh, she's really faithful how she prays for me and our family, our church, and so many of you who are actually watching this video. And so I'm just inspired by her faith and how she prays. And so mom, thank you for that. I love my mom 
since she's beautiful since she bakes with me. Oh, bunny so so work. She did not go full. So no bunny the car. One thing I'm grateful for for my mom is her kindness. She's so good about making sure that I'm okay and that I have what I need every single day. I am grateful for my mom's perseverance and love for her kids. I'm thankful for my mom because she loves me even when I'm mean to her. I am thankful for my mom because she invests so much in my family and loves us no matter what. One huge influence that my mom has had on my life is through cooking. I have never really enjoyed cooking at all, especially not growing up, um, but my mom is an amazing cook and she took time out of her day to uh, teach me when I was younger, so I'm definitely grateful for that now. I love my mom so much and one of the things that I'm most grateful is that she has always been my biggest supporter. The best part about my mom is that she is not only my best friend, but she is the number one cheerleader and mentor that I've had in my life. Uh, she has shown me Jesus in a way that no one else has. And she's just the best mom in the whole wide world. Thanks, mom. My mom taught me about sacrificial love. My dad was gone a whole lot for work, so my mom was often playing the role of both father and mother in the household. And because of that, she was taking up three jobs a whole lot throughout my middle school and high school career. Mom, thank you for all the, the things that you've done that I've, I've never thanked you for. I don't think until somebody grows up and maybe has children of their own do they realize how much a parent, a, a mom does for their children. Thank you. I'm really inspired by Miss Robin, my church youth director growing up. I always looked up to her as a really strong leader. So I'm the only boy in my family and I have three sisters who are all wonderful mothers to their children um, and have all been wonderful sisters to me and so I really appreciate their presence in my life. I know if I was to pick a woman that inspired me, I know my wife, baby, you inspire me to be a better man. You inspired me to do more work. One woman who is always really inspiring to me is my fiance, Lindy Stark. Uh, she is the hardest working person I've ever met. And uh, whenever I am feeling down about something or low motivation, I just think about Lindy and how hard she works. Yeah, so something I really appreciate about my Aunt Dara, who's actually my mom's sister, she's hilarious and her specialty is roasting my mom. So that is awesome. And a shout out to my wife, Brittany. She is not only a wonderful mother, but an incredible person. And there's nobody who's had a bigger impact on my life than you. So Brittany, I thank you for that. And a special shout out to my two sisters, Michelle and Tuesday. I love you guys. You're awesome and I'm thankful for you. I like my teach, dance teacher, Michelle, since she learned how to dance with me. My senior year of high school, I had an English teacher and she knew at that point, none of us cared. We just wanted to graduate. Uh, but she was really passionate about English and she really cared about people. And she taught me that if you really care for people well, you can make an impact on them and you can inspire them. And for that, I'm forever grateful. My wife, Lauren, has always impressed me by her dedication to her family and her tenacity toward her work. Uh, she doesn't go halfway. She gives all of herself to the things that are important to her and doesn't settle for anything less than her best. I'm thankful for my sister, Abby, for always being kind and for all the paintings she makes for me. My grandma exemplifies what it means to be a strong woman. Um, one woman who's really inspired me would have to be my high school art teacher. She taught me to embrace my creative side and that no idea is a bad idea. My fiance, Christina May, inspires me to have greater intentionality with relationships. My wife, Emily, inspires me every day. She shows me how much uh, the love of a mom can go. So other than my mother, a woman that had a really big impact in my life was my swim team coach. From six years old to 18 years old, she taught me hard work 
and she gave me leadership roles and within that she taught me consistency. One woman who inspires me to be better than I am is our very own Chrissy Naylor. She is such a loving mother to her kids, but not only that, but she also loves everybody that she sees and everyone around her. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. We want to celebrate with those of you that are celebrating and grieve with those that you are grieving and just celebrate all women this morning. Yeah, and if you'd like to connect with us, it's at New City RDU on all our social media handles, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Spotify, all of them. All of them. We would love to connect with you. And we're actually still having community groups right now, all virtually mm -hmm. via Zoom. So if you're new around here, we would love to plug you into community groups so you can meet some new people and really get connected here. You can do that at newcityrdu.com slash groups. Yeah, and if you'd like to give, we'd love to invite you to give at newcityrdu.com slash give and thank you for all your generosity now on to dylan with the message Woo! Hey, New City, happy Mother's Day to you, whether today is an exciting or an a joyous occasion, even if you're going to be celebrating differently than you normally do. Maybe today's a hard or difficult day to you. I hope you feel encouraged this morning and you were at least encouraged by the video that we shared. Uh, I want to begin this morning by talking about a few irrational childhood fears that I had. Like many of you, when you were a child, you probably thought things that were not true. And so you were afraid of things that didn't actually exist and it changed the way that you maybe approach certain things. So for example, a couple of weeks ago, I, sh I shared how I had an irrational childhood fear of a great white shark being in the deep end of a swimming pool. So like I would be afraid if I was the only one in the pool that there could be a shark there. And so like it changed a little bit more apprehensive, right? I also remember this week, there was this show when I was a kid called Animorphs. I Googled it. Apparently it didn't last very long because it wasn't very good. But it was like these five kids who could transform into animals, apparently. And I just remember as a kid watching the intro to the TV show, never watched a TV show. And I got so freaked out because at one point they had this eye, this giant eye show up in the midst of like darkness. And it scared me so much that every time I went up the stairs at our house, I grew up in a two-story house, and there was this massive window at the front of our stairs. If it was nighttime and I was going up the stairs, in my mind, these anamorph eyes would somehow show up and could possibly somehow like reach through the window and grab me. And so as a kid, if I was going up the stairs at night for a short period by myself, I would book it up the stairs to make sure these eyeballs somehow wouldn't see me and grab me, right? It was an irrational fear that was not going to happen, but it, it changed the way that I went up the stairs. And I share that because this morning we're looking at this question. How afraid should we be of sin? This morning, as we continue our, our study through the book of Colossians, written by Paul in the early 60s AD in Rome to the church in Colossae, he's been talking about how Jesus is over everything, how he grants us salvation and love and grace and mercy. And it's nothing that we do to earn it, but God's goodness and kindness in, in our life changes our hearts. And this morning, we're going to be talking about sin. So if we are in Christ, how should we view sin? Is sin just something that's bad, but that God's going to forgive us anyway, so it doesn't really matter? Should we take it really seriously? Like, what's the appropriateness, how we should view it? And if we're afraid of sin, how should that affect how we actually live? Is it worth altering our life to avoid? That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. And so we'll be in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. If you have a Bible, you can flip there. Not the verses will be uh, uh, on the screen as I read them. In Colossians chapter 3, again, the context behind all of this so far is that Christ is Lord, He is King, and He saves us. And so the last few weeks we've been talking about how uh, we can do certain things to grow in our faith and to honor God, and those things are good. 
but they don't actually save us. And so as long as we're doing them uh, from a good posture and attitude of trying to love God and love, on, uh, love others, doing good things are good, but not in the way that they actually save us because only Christ can do that. And so here's what he says, chapter 3, starting in verse 1. He says, so if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. What he's saying is that if you have been risen in Christ, for those of us that have trusted and followed in Jesus, uh, we do not have to struggle to attain being God's people, being uh, sons and daughters of him by right living. Right? right living does not give us the status of God's people. Only Christ can do that. And so what he's saying is that we have been given this status of God's people. And because we've been given it, now we can, allow, we can follow Jesus and allow this status to work itself out in us. In other words, Paul is saying that we should seek Christ and live in a way that is worthy of his name. Because we have been given his name and his inheritance and his righteousness, we should pursue a life that is worthy of what he has given us. Verse 4, it says, For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Right? This is the biblical concept that we see throughout the New Testament of this idea of living in the already, but not yet. So as Christians, we, be- we belong to the new age that has dawned with Christ's coming, with his death, burial, and resurrection. And ultimately, when he returns again to establish his new kingdoms in the heavens and the earth, we will be a part of it. But the present old age, we are also still living in it, right? It is not over until Christ returns a second time. And so we are already headed towards God's kingdom, but God's kingdom is not fully in its fruition until Christ's return. And so Paul is encouraging us to live towards that day. To give you some maybe uh, cliche examples of, of what this actually means, think of, for example, of somebody who is engaged to be married. Right? If you're engaged to be married, you're not married yet, but there are certain things about your life that you change to prepare because you're going to get married. So, for example, if you're engaged to get married, you're probably not on a dating app trying to find a date, right? At least I wouldn't recommend that, right? Technically, legally, you're still single. You're not married yet. You're planning to get married. You're on the way to marriage, and so you're re-altering your life for that future reality. Or if you're engaged and maybe you have a job opportunity or something that you want to pursue, you're probably not going to move to California if your fiance wants to move to New York. Like you got to find a way to live in the same area together. Even though you're not married yet, you're going to be. And so you orient yourself around that future. Another example would be a draft pick. You know, all professional sports leagues here in America, they hold a draft every year. And what happens is they draft their players But before they sign the actual contract to join the team, because that takes some time, they already go ahead and send the players the playbook. They give them access to the team facilities. Uh, They give them all the swag and all all the gear that goes with being a part of that team. Even though they haven't signed the contract yet, they're living towards a future reality. And all that to say, when it comes to following Jesus or really anything in our lives, here's the point. That what we live for determines how we live. What we live for determines how we live, right? What jobs we pursue, what hobbies we pursue, what relationships we pursue, whatever it is that we're living for will affect how we live in other areas of our life. So Paul is encouraging us to pursue Jesus because that will impact every area of our life. And here is why ultimately we ought to be pursuing Jesus, not out of obligation or guilt, but because we are actually sons and daughters of the king. Here's why. He says, therefore, here's what this looks like. He says, therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. What he's saying is that if you and I have been raised with Christ, we must put to death death whatever belongs to our earthly and selfish nature. Now, put to death, maybe in modern terms, here's what you can think of. Put to death when talking about sin means taking severe measures to overcome it or to conquer it 
or to flee from it, right? It's not a reactive thing in, sense of, in the sense of when you sin, and I think all of us are guilty of this, we think, well, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to try really hard not to blow it again. That is a reactive reaction to sin. Instead, we ought to take a proactive reaction to it, which is more so thinking along these lines. Here is what I'm going to do to avoid it. And so instead of reacting when we sin, we're going to proactively plan to how can I avoid sin instead of reacting to it when it happens, right? And so he gives some examples of sins that we ought to avoid that are good for us to avoid. He talks about sexual immorality and impurity and lust. Uh, These are things, biblically speaking, sexual immorality is defined as any sort of intercourse or sexual activity that takes place outside the covenantal marriage of a man and woman. A woman. That's how scripture defines sexual immorality. And so in the one hand, reacting to sexual sin could say, well, I blew it and I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to try really hard. But a proactive approach practically could look like this. What software am I going to put on my devices to help me fight against sexual sin? Uh, What accountability or who do I need to allow into my life to help me fight against this? There's a difference between being reactive or being proactive. He also talks about uh, greed, which the best definition of greed that I have found is simply this, unchecked hunger for physical pleasure. I think sometimes we just view greed as like monetary and trying to get a lot of money and that can be part of it. But it really greed is any unchecked hunger for physical pleasure, which if, which if taken to its you know, logical ending is idolatry, right? It's about what you want, what I want, regardless of what it costs and regardless of who it could negatively impact or negatively impact our relationship with God. Idolatry and greed makes you and I the center of our world instead of God himself. And what Paul is saying here is that he wants us to put sin to death before sin kills us. He wants us to put sin to death before sin kills us because sin impacts us physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. It has negative, massive consequences in our life. And so we need to be proactive against fighting against it, not just reactive when it comes. And here's why, verse 6. Here's another reason why we need to be proactive to put our sin to death. He says, because of these, the sins that he mentions and being sinful and pursuing our own things in our life, because of these... God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. God's wrath is real. It is a real thing, right? When Jesus returns a second time, he is coming to, before he establishes his new kingdom on heaven and and on the earth, to judge evil and purge it for what it is. By, By the way, of which all of us, have taken a part, right? All of us have done evil things. All of us have fallen short of God's perfect moral standard. And this is what makes his first coming so great, right? This is what makes Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection 2,000 years ago so amazing. That God is a good God. God's wrath is actually what makes him good. That he actually deals with sin, punishment, and evil. He doesn't just say, all bad things happen. I don't really care. You're good. Come on into heaven. He says, you know what? I'm a righteous and a good God, and so I'm going to judge evil. And so Jesus takes the sin, takes the wrath of God on our behalf. That is what makes him good, right? If you want to make this uh, in more practical terms, many of you are familiar with uh, Ah Ah Ahmad Aubrey, who this week, uh, there was a video released how back in February, he was a black man jogging through a neighborhood, was confronted by two white men in a truck and shot and killed. And no arrests were made because the men claimed that they uh, identified him as a burglar that, who, had burglar, or who had burglarized some homes a few days ago, and they mistook him as that suspect. Well, this week, video was shown of that he was literally just walking, jogging down the street. They confront him, they shoot him, and they kill him. Right? And so now there is being justice demanded that this ought to go to trial, that these men need to be responsible for their evil, that they straight up shot a man for no reason other than thinking he might could have done something wrong. 
They, they were not legal. They were not uh, cops. They were not any part of the legal system. They took it upon themselves to do what they thought, whatever they wanted to do. And so we look at this video, which was horrific, and we hear these stories and we say, justice must be served. Right? We can't say what they did doesn't matter. And so let's just go on living our lives as if evil doesn't matter. What we see is that when we see evil, when we see injustice, we say something must be done about that. And this is what Jesus does when he comes, that he provides a way for us to experience the grace and mercy of God while still dealing with our sin. And God's wrath is coming upon evil and judgment and sin. And it's up to us to decide, do we want to trust God with what the grace that he has given us? Or do we think to our own shame and demise that we can kind of outwit God or we can kind of argue our way to say, you know what, I've done evil things, but I don't need to be forgiven. I don't need your grace. What Paul is saying here is that God will not stop us. In his grace, he actually will not stop us uh, from committing sin. He will not make us turn to him. He allows us to make that decision. But the effects of sin, as we see, are seen and felt even before other people find out, right? When we sin, we often think, well, it's only bad if other people find out about it. As long as no one else finds out about it, and I'm not hurting anyone else, it's okay. But yet we know the reality of sin is that it impacts us whether or not it's actually found out. I love what David Garland said in his commentary on this passage in Colossians. It's a few sentences long, but I want to read it because it really encapsulates what actually is going on here. Here's what he says. This concept reveals that most people's doctrine of sin is too shallow. They think the problem with sin resides only with God. Don't push God too far or God will get you. The result is that people tend to treat sin as something to be dreaded only if it is detected. They fear getting caught and hope that maybe God is not looking or that perhaps God can be propitiated, in other words, soothed in some ways to spare them from any retribution. But sin is like cancer that grows out of control and destroys other healthy parts of ourselves. The cancer is the deadly thing, not its detection. Only after the cancer has been diagnosed can treatment begin. The problems come when it goes undiscovered and untreated. Like cancer, sin carries with it its own destructive force. It is something that ruins lives. It distorts and destroys our human relationships as well as our relationship with God. Again, we often think as long as nobody finds out about it, then it's okay. But by its very nature, regardless of whether people find out about it or not, it destroys us, right? Just like a physical ailment, even if it's not diagnosed, it can still impact you, so can sin. It reminds me when I was in high school, uh, I uh, basically was diagnosed with uh, esophageal perforation, esophageal perforation. Now you're like, what is that? Let me explain it to you. Uh, one weekend, I was having trouble swallowing. Like no matter what it was, my, my throat really hurt, right? And so on uh, Monday morning, I go to school and I'm like really dizzy, really lightheaded because re- even if it was drinking water or eating yogurt, like I couldn't do anything. I couldn't swallow anything without a lot of pain. So I go to school and I'm like, I'm really dizzy. I'm not feeling good. So I go home. We go to the emergency room just so we can be seen about trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, they give me an IV and and so that helps a little bit. I kind of kind of come to a little bit more. And they say, well, there's something going on with your throat, obviously. But since it's not an emergency, we'll set you up with an ear, nose, and throat doc- uh, doctor's appointment tomorrow. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm not going to die, but this is really painful. But they said tomorrow. So I go back home. The next day, and I'm, I'm in a lot of pain, still can't eat or drink anything. We go to the ear, nose, and throat doctor. They put this tiny little black tube through my nose, down my throat. It was awful. Uh, They take it out. I almost pass out. Everything's turning purple. And they say, well, the bad news is whatever's uh, affecting you, it's actually further down in your throat than we can uh, see. And so basically they said, whatever's affecting your throat, we can't find it. And so uh, it's too far down there. So tomorrow we're going to schedule you an important with an, an appointment with an endoscopy. And so I go the next day, hoping today's finally today, we're going to figure out what's happening. And so basically they put me to sleep. They got this tube, they put it down my throat and they took pictures of my esophagus, come to find out that I had multiple holes that were burned into my esophagus. What happened was I had been taking this uh, acne medicine and these pills were rather large and apparently a few of them 
had got stuck in my throat because I hadn't drank enough water, and they were literally burning holes in my esophagus. And so they, they said two things. Number one, stop taking the pills, which I had stopped like four days ago because I couldn't swallow anything. And number two, they gave me this kind of med- medicine to soothe my throat as it healed. And then a week or two later, if I was still experiencing pain, they'd have to do something else. Fortunately, between not taking the medicine anymore and the soothing stuff that they gave me, I was fine. Now, I share that because I was experiencing a lot of physical pain even before we knew what was happening. And this is what sin does to us. What Paul is showing us here is that God's wrath not only is supposed to expose the the seriousness of sin, but it's also supposed to be redemptive for us, right? When we compare sin to cancer or maybe a physical ailment, we realize that it is the cancer that we hate, not the person with the cancer. And so, so it is with us, right? So it is with us. In other words, you could put it this way. Here's what we would say when it comes to sin. That sin is destructive by nature, not discovery. Sin is destructive by what it is, not by when it is found out, right? Sin is the problem, not whether or not somebody knows about it. Sin by itself is the problem, just like my throat. My issue with my throat was there even before we knew what the actual problem was. And here's what we know. Some of you are struggling mightily right now with some sin in your life, and nobody knows about it, and yet you're feeling devastating effects from it, right? Even though people may not know about it, it is sin that is destructive by nature, not discovery not discovery. And so again, we'll read this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 6. It says this, because of, because of these, because of sin in our life, uh, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. What he's saying is that many of them, many of these Colossian believers and us can relate to the difference in pain that we have experienced either before we met Jesus or in past sins that we were walking in. We felt the devastating effects of sin, right? All of us have. And so here's what he says to do. He says, verse 8, but now put away all of the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. What he's saying is do not do these things, both the things he reaches in verses 8 and verse 5. Now, of course, the answer is, the question is, why? Why? The reason we should avoid these things is that we, should, we have to put them off instead and follow God's way for us. What we're seeing here is that sin matters not just because it is bad, but because it kills us. And one of the things we talk about often here at New City Church is that Jesus ultimately came to give us and to offer us life. That Jesus came to offer us life and sin stops that from happening. The Christian life is a life that ought to be marked by love for God and love for others. And these sins prohibit that, right? And so just for example, when he says filthy language, we might assume that he's talking about cussing. Like just don't say bad words. That's not what he means here. What he means here is that how we speak to others matters. That filthy language is determined not just by what we're sa- whether or not what we're saying is true, and fa- true or false, but how, whether or not it harms one another. So you can say something that is true, but you can say, say it with malice or anger or to get back at somebody and you can hurt somebody because your attitude and your heart was not in the right place. And so even though what you're saying is true, it could actually still be described as filthy language because your desire is not to love them. And so we should put away these things because it stops us from loving God and loving others. It stops us from experiencing the life that God wants us to experience. Verse 9, he then says this. He says, Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. Right? Again, don't do these things. Why? Because you have put off your old self and have put on your new self as you follow Christ. Again, sin matters not just because it is bad, but because it kills us. That life can be found in Christ, and it is an ongoing process. Again, I'll read one more quote by David Garland. He puts it this way. He says that we should never confuse being moral with being Christian. But we cannot claim to be Christian if we ignore morality. 
right? We cannot confuse, we should not confuse being moral with being Christian. Being a good person does not make you a follower of Christ. Jesus and what he has done invites you to be a follower of Christ. But at the same time, we cannot claim to be followers of Christ, to be in Christ, if we ignore what he is telling us to do and ignore the seriousness of our sin. And what he's trying to say above all else is he's trying to say that you should avoid sin, that you should fight against sin because you can, that you do not have to be controlled by sin because of your status in Christ and with the help of his spirit, the spirit and fellow believers, you can overcome it. You have this ability. You can think of it like this, all good stories, whether it's a movie or a show or a book or whatever, all good stories pretty much follow the same storyline, right? And you have a hero, which is the main character, who is trying to accomplish something, trying to do something, but yet they can't do it. There's some sort of setback or some sort of tragedy or something that they face that stops them from doing what they might want to do. And so then you have a guy who might be a, a supporting actor, one of the other uh, prominent roles or characters in the story who comes along and tells the hero, tells the main character, you can do this, right? This guide comes along and pulls out of the hero what is already there so that the hero can live happily ever after. And what is happening here is Paul is saying that I'm not telling you to fight sin out of your own self-will or out of your own self-determination. I'm telling you to fight sin because you can actually do this, right? In Christ, your sin does not have to control you. And here's what we know about most sin, most ongoing sin. We know this, happens in secret. If you are struggling with an ongoing sin or weakness in your life right now, I would guarantee that nobody knows about it. Or maybe a couple of people may know about it, but they don't know to the extent of what is actually going on and how much you are actually dealing with, dealing with it, right? Most ongoing sin is done in secret. It's done in secret. And what, Paul, what, what he's saying here is that this does not have to be the case. So let's expose it for what it is. Let's show it for what it is. And here's why. Here's what it says in verse 11 of Colossians chapter 3. He says this, the last verse that we read. He says, in Christ, here's why we need to be honest with our sin. He says, in Christ, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian and Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is is in all, or is all, and in all. What he's saying here is that in Christ, there is no distinction in your status. There is no distinction between who can get the types of people who can be forgiven and loved by God and those that can't. Uh, and so he gives uh, types of people in their culture of distinctions that they would have drawn. So they might have said a Greek and Jew would be a non-Jew or a Jew, uh, circumcision and uncircumcision, those who follow the Old Testament law and those who don't, barbarian and Scythian, slave and free. These were different categories of people that they would have thought of. In modern times, we could think of Paul saying this, there is no black and white or Asian. There is no rich or poor. There is no uh, powerful and impowerful or unpowerful people. What Paul is saying here is not that our differences don't matter. Our differences do matter and our cultures and our backgrounds are beautiful and they are to be celebrated. What he's saying, however, is that they are irrelevant to the question of who we should love, honor, respect, and forgive. No matter who you are, no matter what categories you would use to define yourself, those are irrelevant in regards to who actually should receive the grace and mercy of God. In other words, what Paul is saying here is this, is that there is no distinction for who can receive forgiveness. There is no distinction for who can receive forgiveness. That as we face the reality of our sin, we don't need to cower in shame. We don't need to cower in fear because God's grace is sufficient for everybody. And this is the good news of the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is King, that Jesus is above all things, and you are not, that you cannot earn your way to God's grace, that you could not do so many good works to simply take away the sins that you have committed. The gospel is that God came into human history, this perfect God, to become a perfect man through his perfect life, burial, death, burial, and resurrection has given us the opportunity to see and experience him. The gospel is the good news that there is no slave or free, no Jew or Greek, no black or white, no rich or poor that is beyond the grace and mercy of God. His invitation is to come to him and experience life, to come to him and experience 
life. That sin matters, but God's grace is bigger and sufficient and is offering us a way to experience him. And so to sum up this entire passage, here's what I think is most important for us to know as we talk about sin, and that's this. That sin either destroys or will be destroyed. Sin either destroys us or it will be destroyed. And this is what is going to happen at the end of the age when Christ returns. He is going to destroy sin once and for all. And in our lives today, we can face sin. We can be proactive about fighting it. Or we can allow it, allow it to run, run our lives, ruin our lives, kill us, and allow and make us miss out on the life that God wants for us. Sin either destroys or will be destroyed. We have to decide how seriously we are going to take it. It reminds me of Augustine. You may be familiar with him. He lived in the 4th and 5th centuries. He is one of the most um, uh, prolific, not just Christian thinkers, but all-time thinkers in human history. Uh, he has a story. Uh, he was not a Christian. His mom was a devout believer who prayed for him often. Uh, as he became adult, he converts to Christianity. And so he's writing uh, about you know apologetics for Christianity, defense of the faith. And at one point, he writes about how when God was first in the spirit, was first changing his heart and softening his heart towards him. How Augustine, one of his uh, sins, if you will, was sexual morality. He slept around with a lot of women. And so as he started to pursue God and follow God, he wrote down this prayer. And he reflect later in life, he writes that he used to pray that God would give him chastity, but not yet. He said, I would pray, God, give me chastity, but not yet. I know you have a good design for sex, but I'm enjoying this right now, and I don't think it's that big of a deal, and so I'll figure it out later, right? And so he writes, look, talking about how he misunderstood the seriousness of sin. And I think many of us find ourselves in that same place when it comes to ongoing sin in our life. We say, God, we know this is important, but help me fight through it, but not like do what I, everything that I should to overcome it, because I can still deal with it. What Paul is saying here is that is not the good and healthy and loving approach that you should take. That you and I should be proactive with our sin, not reactive. And if we are continuing to fall into the same sins, into the same weaknesses time and time again, it's because we are not putting to death, we are not being proactive, we are not taking seriously the seriousness of our sin. That sin either destroys us or will be destroyed. And the question for you and for me as I end today are what sins do you need to repent of today? What do you need to repent of today? Not out of shame or guilt or condemnation, but simply so that you can experience life. Here's my personal challenge for you. If you have a sin in your life that you need to deal with today, that you would call, text, email, go see, do whatever you need to do today to take steps towards fighting it. Do not wait till tomorrow. Do not say, okay, this is a good point. I feel the spirit convicting me. I'll, I'll address this tomorrow because you will not do that. You will not address it tomorrow, and you know you won't address it tomorrow because you've been dealing with this sin for a while. What do you and I need to repent of, turn to God at today, and allow God to change and speak into our life? Sin either destroys or will be destroyed. And listen to me, the church, your local church, if you're a part of New City Church, ought to be the safest place in the world for you to confess your sin. This is the safest place for you to be honest about the struggles that you have been dealing with so that we can come around one another and experience the life, grace, and forgiveness that God gives. Sin either destroys or will be destroyed. And Paul is saying, look to Jesus, follow him, put away sin, experience the life God offers. But you can only do that if you take sin serious. Not in, this, not in the vein of you better stop sinning or God won't love you, but in the vein of because God loves you and wants good for you, put this away and follow him. What do you need to repent and be honest of today so that sin will not destroy you, but so that you can destroy it? And so as I close, I just want to pray for us towards that end. Here's what I want to pray for us towards that end, that we would take sin seriously, and then we will worship and sing one more song together. So would you pray with me? God, you are gracious and good. And here's what we know, that all of us are fallen human beings, that all of us sin, and all of us have weaknesses and issues that we need to confront today. And my courage is for those that are listening, and my encouragement and my prayer for those that are listening is that they would be honest about their sin. Those that have had sin and dark secrets that they've been keeping for weeks, months, or years, 
maybe even decades, that today they would realize the seriousness of it and repent and take steps towards life. God, would you give us the courage to talk to the people that we need to talk to, to reach out to the people that we need to reach out to, and to repent to you of our fallenness, not out of shame or guilt, but out of conviction by your spirit to help us see and experience the goodness of who you are. May we be a church of repentance. May we uh, be a church that is pursuing holiness so that we can be best positioned to be on mission, to help as many people as possible see and experience the gospel of who you are. And it starts with us being honest about our fallenness. It starts with us being honest that we do not have it all together. And as we take steps of faithfulness, as we take steps of repentance, we can encourage one another to do the same. God, we know that sin will either destroy us or it will be destroyed. Would you give us the courage to be honest about our sin? Give us the courage and the desire to pursue you in our sin so that we can experience the hope and the healing that you have. God, thank you for your gift of life. Thank you for being a good and gracious God. Thank you for being a God that is your kindness, your kindness that leads us to repentance. And maybe we experience that this morning as we repent of the ways that we have fallen short and experience and follow you, Jesus, into the life that you have for us. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your goodness. Would you make us a people of repentance? And in Jesus' awesome name, I pray. Amen. This next song that we're going to sing is called Highlands, and it's a really awesome song that's been ministering to me really well lately, especially the lyric, you're the summit where my feet are. Um, This song uses a lot of mountains and valleys imagery, and the idea is that whether you're on the mountain and life is going really well for you, or you're in the valley and things um, aren't going so well, that as long as your feet are planted firm uh, with Jesus, and as long as you make him your summit, then whatever we walk through, wherever we are, His name will move mountains wherever we stand. Um, So let's sing this song um, and really worship and exalt Jesus and put him in that spot in our lives, um, that spot in the summit. In the highlands and the heart it calls. 
guys, thanks again for watching this morning. I hope you guys enjoyed it. As a reminder, um, you can follow us on all social media platforms. I won't list them again, but it's at New City RDU. Yes, and remember, sin either destroys or will be destroyed. New City Church, you, you are, are sent. sent.